Hi, this is Rish Outfield. And Big Anglovich here to talk about the Audio Market List, an online resource you need to check out. Oh, I, I checked it out long ago. Good stuff. No, I mean the people listening to this commercial need to check it out. Whoops. Um, hey, can we start again? No time, sorry. Uh, the Audio Market List is a collection of fiction markets on the internet who will air authors' work and podcast it in both paying and non-paying formats. It's the first and largest market list exclusively dedicated to audio fiction and includes links to writing workshops, conventions, podcasts on writing, and author associations. The author associations, that's a mouthful. But what do, you, wait, what do you call it when words in a sentence all start with the same? Alliteration, Rish. Can you just read what's in front of you? Sorry. Can, can we start over, do you think? No. The uh, Audio Market List won a Truly Useful Site Award from Predators and Editors, and it features frequent updates about contests, new markets, and newsworthy notes from fiction audio sources. It's free, with no membership required, and it's packed with absolutely no MSG. Rish, what did I tell you about... It says it right here! No MSG! Oh, I thought you were just... Um, do you think we can start again? Definitely. Just read one more line. Oh, so check it out at www.audiomarketlist.com. Thanks. Okay, take two, go. Hi, this is Rish Outfield. And Big Anglovich here to talk about the Audio Market List. You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. What does the word Doonstief mean? And now here's your host, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Stotty Tom Dielish, Big. Stotty Tom Dielish, Rish. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 2, page 125. Wow, dude, really? Is that a record? I don't know. I could keep going higher. They're all just imaginary pages anyways. It's not like we actually print a magazine. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I am your host, Big Anklovich. I'm sorry, I can't say I'm, I'm Rich Outfield. That's just too embarrassing. Oh, he's a sad sack of crap. I am a host, Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklovich. Along for the ride today is, of course, our robot, R-O-8-O-T. And I press the button. Announcer man. That's right. Today's story... The Spirit of Christmas. Wait a minute. That was last week. What is today's story? To Be Alone Again by Tom Crosshill. What he said. About the author. Over the past decade, Tom Crosshill has translated books, worked inside a coal mine, researched relativity, directed a play, toiled on Wall Street, and operated a nuclear reactor, among other things. He recently won first place in the Writers of the Future contest with his story Seeing Double, which is set in the same universe as the tale you're about to hear. He writes about literature the arts, and life in New York at his website, TomCrossHill.com. We'd also like to thank Liz Mirzievsky, Julie Hoverson, and Josh Roseman for lending their voices to today's episode. Great job, guys. To Be Alone Again by Tom Crosshill Paul Davery awoke with the blood of his boss on his hands. In truth, to say that he awoke was not entirely accurate. Rather, his conjunction ended and he found himself alone in his own body again. But the fact remained that Paul had been gone, and now Paul was back. The corpse of Bill Finners lying at his feet. The end of a conjunction always startled and often saddened. It hurt to give up an existence of shared experience and rich memory. But this time was different. He'd been had. Paul gasped <gasps> as the realization hit him. He lost control of his legs, falling to his knees before Bill's inert form and struggled to breathe. Bill, his boss and closest friend, murdered in his own office, killed by Paul's hand. By habit hard and grained, he slapped partitions around his emotional centers, 
then blinked rapidly as reality lost its edge. There. The partition did not numb him completely, but it would allow him to function. Think, Paul. Think. You have little time. Paul got up, tearing his gaze from Bill's staring eyes. He had to get away. He was screwed, and the bitch who'd screwed him might have tipped off the police. No one would believe he'd killed under conjunction. But he couldn't go to prison. Not before avenging Bill. Paul listened. No running footsteps. No raised voices. The lights were on in the office, but nowhere else on the floor. The office itself appeared almost undisturbed. No sign of struggle apparent except for the dead man on the linoleum. A knife kill, Paul noted. Not much blood. Some on the floor, some on his hands. None on his clothes. But of course, he was a professional. He washed away the blood in the bathroom sink, scrubbing, scrubbing, then headed for the exit. Bill's office was on the 30th floor of an avenue of the Americas skyscraper. Paul called the elevator by force of habit, then took the stairs. He didn't want to get trapped. He made good use of the time it took him to descend by setting up a new memory partition. He locked away the image of Bill's dead body so he need never remember it again. Hey, Paul. Said Jim, the doorman, on the way out. You done for the day? Uh, Almost. Running some errands for the boss. Ah. Said Jim, knowingly. Katrina again? Katrina who? Paul asked, winking half-heartedly. Katrina was Bill's new wife. A stunning Russian redhead, ten years his junior. Paul had followed her around a couple of times on Bill's request, but never found any trace of the infidelity the older man had seemed to expect. Listen, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, have a good one. It was eight at night, and the wind was cold and strong, blowing straight down the avenue with little to impede its force. Even so, the street was busy with dark figures walking quickly. Coats clutched tight around them. A siren wailed in the distance. Paul also walked quickly, heading north, and pulled up a local newsfeed on his view space. The image spliced directly into his optic nerve. No mention of the murder yet. He hailed a cab on the corner of 55th. Roosevelt Island, he told the driver, because that was where he had conjoined the girl. Then he sat back in a seat and closed his eyes, lowering his emotional partitions halfway. Dangerous to repress too long. Bill was gone never to return. They went back ten years, to the war in the Baltic. They'd been each other's conjoined partners. Paul was strong and agile, Bill aggressive and smart. With Bill's brains and Paul's body, they made for a deadly combination. Those were the good days, a golden time compared to what came later. After the war, Bill refused to join with him again. He'd accepted Paul's friendship, even hired Paul to do his muscle work, but never consented to that mental intimacy. Paul didn't understand it, still resented it. He'd spent years trying to replace that relationship, experimenting with hundreds of conjoined partners, but all in vain. Now he'd never get it back. Traffic was light, and the ride to Roosevelt Island only took ten minutes. Paul paid the driver from his emergency numbered account and got out at the joiner's nest. The nest was a little-known bar on the queen side of the island, dimly lit and none too clean, a lonely pap sign flickering in the window. It attracted limited clientele in the upscale neighborhood. Tonight was no exception. There was but one patron sitting at the counter, nodding over his drink to the accompaniment of some blues ballad from the jukebox. Paul nodded at the bartender and headed straight for a door marked Employees Only. Conjoining with strangers was a booming but illegal business, so joining studios across the country kept a low profile. Beyond the nondescript door lay a well-lit lobby of soft carpets and leather armchairs. Beppe, the manager, an elderly man with a kind of healthy complexion that suggested regular exercise and abstention from bodily vices, stood behind a narrow marble counter, talking with a pair of female customers. He smiled at Paul over their shoulders. I'll be with you in a second. Paul nodded and sat down in the waiting area. He watched the women, twins he now saw, as they talked with Beppe animatedly. Their voices betrayed both excitement and trepidation. First timers, probably. Paul envied them even as he pitied the ignorance implicit in their eagerness. 
Before long, Beppe walked over to shake Paul's hand. It's a pleasure to see you again so soon, he said, his voice discreetly low. Might you be interested in a trip with these ladies there? Parallel can join you now. Paul took a reassessing look at the women. He recognized the signs now, the subtle way their every gesture seemed in harmony, the way they just looked at each other and nodded every once in a while, smiling, not saying a word. Not tonight, he said, not needing to feign the regret. Could we talk in private? Beppe's face showed no reaction, but something in his stance shifted. Certainly. He turned back to the twins and raised his voice. Ladies, if you would wait here a moment, I believe your party will be along presently. Then, to Paul. This way. He led Paul into an empty joining room off the lobby. It was circular, with three low beds placed like spokes from the center, where sat a squat white conjoin router. Paul knew that router all too well. Many times it had transformed strangers he'd never met before into companions more intimate than lovers. Many times had his body lain there while his mind traveled in another's outside in the city. Is anything the matter? asked Beppe, pulling Paul out of his reverie. Blunt was best. I got hijacked yesterday. Beppe's eyes widened, but that was the extent of his reaction. That is unfortunate. It's more than unfortunate, Paul said, keeping his voice civil. It's going to be the end of you if you were involved. I run a clean business, Beppe said. I provide a conjunction, that's all. What my clients do with it is their concern. Even so, Paul said, I need to know who she was. The girl I conjoined. She called herself Jill. Uh, you know we don't keep records of our clients. Bullshit, Paul said. You collect everything you can just to cover your ass. I've noticed you poking around my own ports more than once. Beppe inclined his head slightly, as if in a shrug that was below him to complete. I don't think I can help you. Listen, I killed a man tonight, Paul said, lowering the partition on his anger to give an edge to his words. What do you think the police will say when they find out you were involved? The man did pale now, and he stepped back from Paul toward the door. That's impossible. Not unless you wanted to. Paul shoved him against the wall, hard. I did not want to, he said. He was my friend. That girl forced me into it, and you're going to help me find out how. The old man hesitated for one long moment, then nodded. Fine. She had her ID ports wide open. I'm sending the data to you now. The information arrived over line of sight infrared. A very soft user ID. Thank you, Paul said, releasing the man. Don't come back. I won't, Paul assured him as he turned to go. BellySoft was a popular net service facilitator, and user identification was a black hat cottage industry. Ten minutes and five hundred dollars later, Paul had a name, Natalie McGill, and an address for an apartment in Hell's Kitchen. He took a cab back to Manhattan. She'd seemed so safe, Jill, the red-headed teen beauty, young and innocent. Paul had known anonymous conjoining had its dangers. Unwanted murder was supposed to be impossible, yet compelled petty crime was common enough. But he'd seen no threat in a girl like Jill. Who would have? He wondered what he'd do to her. Paul remembered, vaguely, that he could be cruel. He knew he'd done cruel things during the war, although the details he'd partitioned away. He'd been one with Bill back then. Paul got out of the cab, one street short, and walked over on foot. The apartment building was close to 10th Ave, and he stopped under the awning of a dry cleaners on the corner to take it in. Lights were on in most windows, but he had no way to tell which was hers. For a moment, he debated going straight in to find her, but that seemed a risky solution. He brought up the white pages on his view space instead and searched for phone listings under the name of McGill. Seven, but only one on this street. He was about to dial when the door of the apartment building opened, and she stepped out with a shopping bag in hand. She had a large winter jacket on and a wool cap on her head, but there was no mistaking the red curls poking out from under it or the freckles on her face. 
Paul half ran, half walked to her. She looked toward him as he approached, but made no move to run, nor did she appear scared. It's you! She exclaimed. Surprised? He asked, keeping a tight leash on his anger. She seemed not to have heard, grinning at him. I saw you in the joint struck today, she said. Me? In a joint struck? He asked, confused. Joint structing was storytelling via conjunction, popular with parents the world over. Yeah, she said, nodding. Aunt Katya often shows me joint structs, but I never met someone from one before. What's your name? I'm Ken, Paul said. He could have sworn the Jill he'd met at the nest spoke with a Slavic accent, but this girl did not. There was also an earnest sincerity about her that he did not recollect from before. You must be Natalie. She smiled radiantly. You know my name. Of course. I'm a friend of your Aunt Katya's. Really? That's cool. Do you know Aunt Nadia, too? No, just Aunt Katya. Oh. She said. She frowned in obvious concentration, then half turned as if to go back in. Will you come in and meet Nadia? You could show us a joint strat. Paul could not believe this girl could have colluded in murder. Something was wrong with her mind, he suspected. But she was no killer. Yet, he was sure he'd seen her at the nest. I can't come in, he said. I could show you a quick struct right here, though. Would you like that? She nodded enthusiastically and pulled her cap up to reveal her forehead. Go ahead. Paul drew his portable connection ring from his pocket, then hesitated. What he was about to do, entering a miner's mind without parental permission, was a felony punishable by 15 years. But he had to know. And additional prison time was the least of his worries at this point. He checked the street for observers, then stepped closer to Natalie and put the porticon to her skin. Within seconds, it confirmed her mind was open to dominant conjunction. Paul verified that his own partitions were firmly in place and went ahead with it. Fog, confusion, shards of memory, a tangle, disorganized, pain. Long gray corridors, the smell of antiseptics, green overalls, then fireworks, rapid, bright, hard. Wait, no, not fireworks, gunfire, explosions, blood, someone's hot breath, pain, a face. Paul's face? Natalie's mind was confused, blending current memories with past ones. She cried out in distress, <laughs> shuddering under his touch. But he couldn't let her go. He had to keep looking, had to find what he needed. Somewhere above, a window opened. A woman's voice called. Natasha! Natasha! Što ti tam djaleš? Quick, he had to finish. He cast through Natalie's mind at random, searching for any clue, anything. But all he got were memories of her mother, of running in panic through the dark, of death. There was nothing of use, nothing. Her mind was a twisted mystery. Round this corner, a memory of spring rain. Round that, a memory of blood. Round another, Aunt Katja. A beautiful redhead. He had what he needed. Paul let go of Natalie's mind, and she collapsed to the ground. I'm sorry, he said to her, feeling unclean, and took off at a dead run down the street. A door clanged open behind him. The woman shouted something after him. Natalie cried. He just kept running. Around the corner and down 10th Avenue, fury drove him. He wasn't the first to lie to young Natalie. Aunt Katya, Katrina Finners. She'd broken into Natalie's mind and used her for murder. It all lined up now. She'd used Natalie to enslave Paul via serial conjunction. And somehow, she'd forced Paul to stab Bill, a young wife looking for an inheritance. It was time to pay her a visit. Paul knew Bill and Katrina had an apartment nearby. He'd found it for them. He'd even installed their security system. He changed direction and forced himself to slow down. Best if he arrived composed. As most in Manhattan, Bill's apartment building was a house of tight corridors and narrow staircases. He passed an old man on the way up, stepping aside to give way, not meeting his eyes. Bill and Katrina's apartment occupied the full top floor of the building, so Paul could work on disabling the access system without distractions. Before long, he was inside. 
The apartment was spacious and well lit. Polished wooden floors were matched by carved paneling on the walls, and all the furniture was in dark, reserved colors. Bill had always had good taste. There was perfume in the air, light and sweet. Somewhere, music played. He found her in the living room. She was sitting in an armchair with her eyes closed, tears on her cheeks. La Cuona's La Comparsa revolved on an old turntable. Light, bittersweet music, joyous and sad. It served Paul well as he walked up behind her. She looked striking. Beautiful fire-red hair, fair complexion, sorrow etched on her face. Who could believe here sat a murderess? Paul could not afford doubt. He let go of all emotional partitions. In one smooth motion, he reached around and pushed his porticon to her forehead. Immediately, he launched takeover routines, forcing himself into her mind in the fastest, most violent way possible, flooding her with emotion, binding her in place. The outside world stopped existing for the two of them. The music faded away, the light of the living room also. They were joined as one mind, yet they were also two minds in conflict, and there was nothing but that struggle for either of them. Katrina fought desperately, but Paul's anger, finally released, was brutal, vicious, and he had the element of surprise. Now that he knew what to look for, he recognized the signature of her implants from his conjunction with Natalie. Vindication burning bright within him, he exploited that knowledge to the full. He worked his way into her consciousness, step by step, locking away all avenues of escape, partitioning all means of outside communication away from her aware mind. He did not join with her completely. He did not desire that intimacy. He just suppressed her, forced her into a corner where she was exposed to him and vulnerable. Then he realized she no longer resisted him. You bastard, she said to him, not aloud but in the language of the mind. You killed him. There was real pain in her words, and it took Paula back. You forced me to. I didn't think you could do it, she said. I told myself you could, but I don't think I believed it. Not really. Deep down, I thought you loved him too much. I thought you felt for him what he felt for you. But you murdered him. You cut into him with gusto, and all I could do was watch. Paul's anger, forgotten for a moment, rose in him again. You're babbling, he said. You meant to kill him, and he's dead. What more is there to it? Oh, I meant to she said. My sister and my niece and I, we traveled thousands of kilometers to kill him and to kill you. Even as I came to know the man he'd become, I told myself he deserved to die. Up until this evening, I told myself that. But when you picked up that knife, when you approached him with a smile on your face and drew back your arm, I knew I loved him. I would have given anything to stop you. It was you who murdered Bill, not I. Bewilderment sunk its paralyzing claws into Paul. Her words were nonsense, yet Paul sensed no deceit in her. He cast about for the conviction he'd lost. What of Natalie? You didn't force that young girl into murder? Katrina's mind stilled, her thoughts now subdued, uncertain. I give her a gift, a chance to heal. Paul, sensing weakness, pressed forward. How can murder heal? Revenge can heal. She said, lashing out at him with the thought. It will once she remembers you for what you are. What? You and Bill. Heroes of the army. Bands of the Baltic. You met Natalie before, don't you remember? No. Paul said, once again robbed of momentum. There was little he remembered of the war. Little he allowed himself to remember. Of course not. She said. You're a coward. You partitioned it all away. Neat and clean. Bill never did that. He had the courage to live with his sins. Paul forced a laugh. (laughs) You mean to shame me? I I killed men in the Baltic, yes. Innocent men, too, I killed. You mean to tell me I shot Natalie's father or her brother, maybe? It was war! 
Now it was Katrina who laughed. It was a long and bitter laugh, and it burned Paul with the conviction it bore. But he couldn't retreat. He needed to know. Yet, there was only one way to know with certainty. Release the horrors of that time to haunt him again, sparing nothing. Will you? She asked, suddenly deeper in his mind than he'd thought possible. Dare you? Paul struck down all his partitions at once. There was nothing but the screams, nothing but the fury of that time. It swept him away. He was lost in memory of oneness with Bill, of days and nights of endless battle, of the sun rising over a burning Vilnius, of a little girl clinging to her mother's dead body, screaming, beating on his face with cold little fists. He lost all control, couldn't think clearly, couldn't function. He tried to put the partitions back in place, tried hard but to no avail. Katrina was there, vindictive, in control now. He was left in the quicksand of his own memory. Paul Davery, the modern soldier. Kill, partition, move on. Kill, partition, move on. Never a care in the world for Paul Davery. Earlier that day, with Natalie in his mind, he'd known the truth again. He'd remembered, yes, and hated Bill. Unjustly, unfairly, hated him for the crimes of their conjunction. And Paul had killed him. The only man he'd ever loved, he'd killed. Katrina gave him time in the pain. She let him be for long minutes of agony. Do you see it now? She asked at last. I'd never have done it alone. He said to her, struggling to believe. Nor would have Bill. Only our conjunction could have. Only it had that desire, that cruelty within it. And what if that's true? What does that matter? It was still you who murdered Natalie's father. My brother, before her eyes. And her mother. You took her and you... You... It changed Natalie. What you did that night. Do you know what she's like now? You're responsible for what you create, Paul. Maybe I am, he said at last. I don't understand it. But I won't deny it anymore. It would be cowardly to deny it. But if that night's crimes are mine, Bill's murder is yours. She recoiled. What? You didn't join me to help Natalie heal. You did it for revenge. And it is for that revenge that Bill died. You know that is true. Katrina hesitated, and for a moment, Paul thought she would argue. Then, something broke within her. Yes, she said. I do. And with that admission, she surrendered the last barrier between their minds. It was a violent meeting, a clash of guilt and rage and sorrow. Black, poisonous, and vast. They both welcomed it, for they hoped to drown in it. They thought it would scour them and drive them mad and let them forget. Instead, something strange happened. Something they might have resisted if they'd had the strength. They found an emptiness in each other. In Katrina, a hungry wound raw at the edges, freshly torn, like a black pit of ravaged earth where a great oak has been uprooted whole. In Paul, an older one, scab tissue festering at the edges that had lasted through ten years and an endless parade of conjoined partners only ever growing deeper. Yet in truth, their wounds were the same, matching as two molds made by the same key match, for it was the man they both had loved who had damaged them both. All the anger they felt for each other flowed into these wounds. All their rage and accusation poured into these gaping pits that could never be satisfied. They raged and hated, and raged and hated, until there was nothing left. Then, in the calm that remained, they could not hate each other anymore. For they saw their loss reflected in the other. Only their guilt remained, but that they shared. In that, they came together and became one. They could never love each other. They might never be friends. But there, in the apartment of their dead lover, Paul and Katrina discovered refuge within each other, sanctuary from sins not fully theirs. Soon they would part, 
He faced the world that awaited. Decisions had to be made. There had been a murder. They might flee, they might stay. At the moment, they did not care. There was only one thing that held importance, only one fact that mattered. They need never be alone again. Author's Note Hi, my name is Tom Crosshill, and I'm the author of To Be Alone Again. I wrote the story one hot summer evening while lazing about in Portland, Oregon. I just graduated from college, and the halls of corporate America loom dark on the horizon. It's not a coincidence that the first scene of my story takes place in an avenue of the Americas skyscraper. That's where I was shortly bound, and I believe my, shall we say, eager anticipation comes through clearly in the mood of the piece. I've long been fascinated by the malleability of the human brain. We're on the verge of transformative advances in brain-computer interfaces enabled by that malleability. The usual cyberpunk idea of android avatars projected into virtual space is enticing, but it's only the tip of the iceberg of possibilities. There's no reason why the brain, divorced from our physical bodies, would need to operate in three spatial dimensions, for instance. Chunks of cyberspace real estate with two or four or five dimensional topologies may be better suited for particular purposes. It's a hard idea to wrap our minds around right now because of the stimuli our brain is used to dealing with in everyday life, but I see no conceptual flaw in expecting the brain to adapt to such environments. I often dreamed in two dimensions while in school, for instance. Thinking all day about two-dimensional relativistic physics primed my mind to get some hands-on 2D action in the night time. But that's a topic for a future story. Regarding the subject matter of to be alone again, I've had a particular interest in the melding of minds since I realized that most of my thought processes take the form of internal dialogue with two voices conversing. Should I have that hot dog? Yes, I should have that hot dog. No, I'm going to get fat. That sort of thing. It occurred to me to ask, how can I tell for sure that both voices belong to me? How can I tell that the internal narrative I hear in my head is wholly of my own making? I can't. And if the technology is ever there to beam in snatches of another's narrative, I might accept it for my own. If, in addition to that, the other party were to receive a full neural feed of my sensory experiences, we'd have a functional mind meld. The story at hand was my first exploration of this topic. For a very different take on it, look for my story, Seeing Double, forthcoming in the Writers of the Future anthology next year. All right, welcome back. Good stuff, huh? Wow, that author's note. Yeah, that was good stuff. Interesting. And I didn't understand a damn word he said. He does come across as being a lot smarter than you, or me for that matter. Ooh, High praise. Yeah, for me to say something like that, that's... You do tend to consider yourself a lot smarter than you are. Thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome. It is still the holiday spirit. A little bit is <laughs> left over. I got to say, we had so much fun with the one Russian phrase in the whole story. <laughs> uh, how many times this week have you said Shtoti Tam uh, A few times, I would have to say. Just in the last hour, <laughs> anticipating doing this episode... I think we've just been saying this back and forth. It's funny, we were talking before we started recording about how many unusual phrases we've had to say for uh, this show. Ms. Racta? Yeah, Ms. Racta, we, we were mentioning that one. We talked about some of that stuff from uh, The Strange Affair of the Artisan's Heart, like, Siwatakutli, uh, Felucci. Wow. Feluwininigog. <laughs> oh, yes, that one's a good one. Yeah, all these uh, phrases that we've had to say over the years. And it's funny how we can remember a lot of those. I can remember that so well for some reason. But yeah, it was really nice of Tom. He, he actually anticipated our need on that one. One of the first things he did was send us a pronunciation, not just a written pronunciation guy, but he actually recorded himself pronouncing this phrase for us. It was really, uh, really helpful. Now, I ended up being the voice of this mother. I guess we could have gotten somebody to be the, is it the aunt? Yeah, I think it's the ant. Uh, and just do that one line. But ultimately, I hoped people would just forgive 
us using me to do the voice because it just – it's one of those things where it's like we would never ask somebody to do something we weren't willing to do ourselves. <laughs> well, right, I, I would right. beat you. Sure as hell You're would. You're so noble. But, no, I think you did a good job though. I mean if your voice had sucked – then we probably would have gotten someone else. But since you did a fair job, then, you know, there's no reason. Right out of the gate, I got to say, it's a miracle that we accepted this story because <laughs> cyberpunk, folks. As you know from a couple of weeks ago, just I have such a problem. I, it's a stumbling block for me, the subgenre of cyberpunk. And I don't know that we've ever established. I don't know that I myself know why I dislike cyberpunk so much, except that it reminds me of how ignorant I actually am. <laughs> you know what I mean? When you read something, whether it's a technical paper, whether it's Tom Cross Hill's outro, whether it's a Philip K. Dick story, and you can't make heads or tails of it, you start to think, wow, I'm really dumb. And I, I hate to be reminded that I'm not <laughs> smart. It's interesting, that whole thing. You know, you say it's a miracle that the story got accepted just because it's in a style that we tend to be afraid of, I guess. You too? Well, are you admitting that I'm, you have a problem with I, cyberpunk? I do have a little bit, not as much probably as you, but we, we, we did that story in summer. Uh, Book Scouts of the Galactic Rim. Rim, rim, rim. And. Uh, rim, <laughs> da, rim, da. Rim, rim. Oh, did you just say. <laughs> Sorry, folks. So, <laughs> Warning. Uh, so it contains so, the word rim job. So we did, uh, we did that story. And afterwards, you know, the, a little bit of the discussion was about how non well read we are. We. we, we there's got to be a better word than non-well-read. That sounds like yeah, Orwellian newspeak there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there is a better word. word. You probably just add a Y to something and that's good enough. I'm sure that's... But yeah, we, we talked about how we're not well-read. We don't feel confident in that particular realm. And without making a thing of it we didn't talk to each other about it. Both of us kind of went out and started trying to read science fiction works of science fiction that were important highly um, regarded science fiction right, influential the, the, the seminal works of science fiction warning this episode oh yeah i guess i did say seminal i guess that's that's valid anyways we both kind of went out and started reading these things um without getting together and saying why don't we start doing this i was looking at uh, your blog and you had blogged about reading Stranger in a Strange Land. And I found it interesting because I had basically started doing the same thing. I'd gone out and started looking for some of these works. And in so doing, I decided to pick up Neuromancer by William Gibson, which is granddaddy of them all as far as the cyberpunk genre goes. It was like the first big novel in that whole genre. And I had a really hard time reading it. So much of it didn't make any sense to me. <laughs> There's been other ones that I've done the same thing for. I checked out a Cory Doctorow story called True Names that he wrote with Benjamin Rosenbaum. And I have to admit, I didn't understand what was going on. It, a lot of the stuff that they would mention in there was all about Computronium and huh? the universe when people are no longer people, but they've transcended and become like computer programs that run on <laughs> wonderflonium or what yeah they left me really confused a lot of times it was understandable enough that i could make it through it but yeah i'm not i'm not a computer programmer i've been nothing more than just a user i'm one of those people that the it person in the office wants to yell at because they've screwed things up again by doing stupid stuff i mean i can figure out some of the way those kind of stories go just because i use computers everybody uses computers so they can understand backups and etc but when you get into talking about substrate which i've heard a lot in, in that uh, true name story i don't know what that is maybe i ought to look it up well, when William Gibson wrote Neuromancer, computers would have been completely, totally, utterly different than they are now. Very primitive, at least. Well, even so, just the way that they functioned and the way that you interfaced with them would be completely alien to us today, right? Well, true, but he wrote it in a far future right, setting. But, but was that not the you... basis upon which he built his stories? Was the computer technology of the time the lingo of the time? Or? It was, but, you know, people jacked into their computers and not in a... Warning! 
Today's up. No, not like that. Like a jack. They, they actually stuck the cord into their head or whatever. Their bioports. Mm, you know, it was that kind of stuff. And he would just, he, he made up a lot of things. He conjectured a lot of things that could be what things would be like in the future. Maybe it was because I listened to it on audio. I don't know. Sometimes I felt like I missed important things and then they didn't go back and ex- re-explain it. And because it was audio, you can't just flip a few pages back and reread it. It's like, what was a Microsoft? again i know it he's not talking about that company that bill gates runs it's something else so yeah there was a lot of stuff like that that just left me confused it's hard to read something when you feel dumb for reading it i didn't the good thing is with tom's story i totally didn't feel that way i never felt like they used a whole bunch of big fancy words or computery words or hacker words or whatever to describe things so that was already a plus it seems like part of the danger of cyberpunk. And maybe I'm completely wrong because I stay away from cyberpunk the way that the Wicked Witch of the West stays away from bathhouses. But, uh, How? well, because, see, uh, water made her melt. Oh, she maybe. must have smelled really bad then, huh? That why her skin was green? Yes, it was fungus. <laughs> but it seems like... One of the dangers of writing cyberpunk is basing it too much in the here and now or the technology of the here and now and becoming dated in the way that, you know, a science fiction writer 30 years ago writing about, you know, the 21st century when, you know, the entire buildings were computers and that because of how huge computers were back then. <laughs> right. or there was some sci-fi movie I saw where it took place in 2050 or whatever and they jack in and you hear that modem sound and i was just like wow dude this is so dated already and it's not even close to 2050 you know just using the technology that's at hand instead of making up your own trips you up because of how fast today's technology becomes obsolete you know i I hate to continue on star trek but that's what i know as far as science fiction but you know the tapes that they use to store data that might have been state of the art or state of the future art in 1966 but today it's just like tapes really But the phaser is never going to be obsolete because that's one of those imaginary technologies and warp drive and dilithium crystals and all those things that don't actually exist. You know, a hundred years from now, people may chuckle about warp drive, but they're certainly going to still write about its equivalent, even if they have a different funny name for it. Lots of times with science fiction, you know, they're talking about the year 3000 and yet, you know, he gets in his car or in Star Trek, the J.J. Abrams Star Trek, when the (laughs) ringtone comes on and it's supposed to be 22 something. Uh Um, Although they did have like Budweiser classic and stuff like that. So maybe that's their retro. Oh, wow. Like today we heard a cell phone and it sounded like a ring, ring, like a phone phone. from the 50s or something like that. And so maybe that's what it was. Yeah, maybe. They also had that Kirk had stolen a car and was driving like a, what was it? It was like a car that we would look out the door and see driving down the street any time. And what the heck that was doing in the 22nd century. Whatever. Oh, that's a good point. Now, how would that sucker even drive? Although I'm sure the engine or whatever had been completely swapped out and it ran on a dilithium crystal the size (laughs) of your Pentium processor. Wait, shoot. I promised I wouldn't talk about Star Trek. Dang, how did this happen? A friend of mine from uh, a few years ago complained about First Contact and how how that dude uh, from the movie... Zephram Cochran? Yeah, Farmer Hoggett. Um, Zephram Cochran. <laughs> He's the inventor of warp drive. He's Farmer Hoggett, okay? I'm sorry, you can't change that. But yeah, that was uh, a friend of mine complained about how when he's about to blast off, and it's what, 22nd century? Help me out here. Like 2060. Boy? Okay, 2060, and this guy's about to blast off into space. And he's like, wait, wait, I gotta play my song. And he puts on Steppenwolf's Magic Carpet Ride. That's what, uh, gonna be a, a hundred years? year old song by that point how many hundred year old songs do you listen to but are people really going to be like wait i want to be hip and listen to a hundred year old song but star trek they're <laughs> always listening to mozart or beethoven, well, mozart and, all that. or beethoven and that's 500 years that old by i can then. understand but uh yeah the steppenwolf song seems a little and it's not that it's not worthy of still being listened to it's just that somehow this is supposed to be cool yeah i'm gonna blast off with this cool song well, wait, wait, just this year, there was the Beastie Boys song that was played in the 2009 Star Trek. You know, it's like, whoa, I'm five, uh, a job, a kooba, kooba, nooba, kooba. And right. 
<laughs> yeah, that, that, you know what song I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, Chuba Gooba. That was a good one. <laughs> sabotage. Called? Sabotage. And dude, Sabotage is terrible compared to Magic <laughs> Carpet, right? <laughs> no matter how much people like the Beastie Boys. So I'm just saying. Now, I'm sure that Abrams was trying to make some kind of reminders that this is still Earth and this is still people and these are things that you can relate to. And I don't know, like the diehard Trekkers that were riding it would be like, oh, no, please, there can't be a combustion engine car. At least have have the wheels gone, like on the motorcycle that Kirk drives. Or whatever. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a problem with where, that. Where the only you? problem I have is that terrible Roy Orbison song that plays at the end of First Contact. I think it's called Shooby Dooby. And I was oh. like, dear God, sir, that has been forgotten in 1996 when the movie came out. Do you remember Shooby Dooby? <laughs> don't remember that have you song. ever heard of shooby dooby no well, only then. roy orbison's song i know is uh, anything you want you got it warning today's episode contains singing well what about pretty woman oh, yeah, walking down Sorry. the street those two warning i guess we'll cut that out yeah that probably will be cut i'm totally lost as to what point we were trying to oh pay. no no the, the point this all I goes back ourselves. down to yes the the the, the danger of trying to write realistic science fiction based on the current knowledge or the current level of technology, it's easy to elevate it to the point of fantasy. It's easy to lightsaber. You never have to explain how a lightsaber works. And when people do, you're like, oh, okay. crystals and you, but why not just say that it runs on Wonderflonium? It does, actually. Did you know that? I saw it in the Star Wars Encyclopedia. People try and make things realistic. They, they run that risk of showing their hand of where I was when I wrote this, what I was influenced by. It's the same way that some of the things that they did on the 1960s Star Trek just screams 1960s or the stuff they did in Next Gen screams 1980s. Well, maybe shouts or speaks a little too loudly. Next yeah, generation. they don't really scream in Next Generation. They're a little more reserved than that. Picard is their captain, after all. And I remember making fun of Star Trek for that very reason, talking with a friend of mine, and I was telling him a story idea he had, and he asked me some questions about it. He's like, well, how does this work? And I'm like, I don't know. That's not important. And he's like, oh, oh, I see. This isn't like a Star Trek kind of a story. This is like a Star Wars story where it just is. Okay, no more Star Trek talk. Yeah, um, seriously. I, I can't write hard science fiction. And when I've tried, I give up because it seems to me you need a great deal of experience or a great deal of intelligence or a great deal Some of... Some knowledge, at least, I would think. You need to understand the concepts. You need to be like a physicist or something like that. Tom I, is I don't know if like Tom... 15 things at the same yeah, time. Yeah, he, he's apparently. run a nuclear reactor, so... Well, I, uh, in all fairness, Homer Simpson ran a nuclear reactor. Well, in all fairness, Homer Simpson's not real. So that's probably why he writes the uh, hard sci-fi and we write the magical realism. How dare you use Abby Hilton's words against me? <laughs> uh, but to each their own. I, I, I in no way mean to slight cy- – well, I mean to slight cyberpunk, but in my own I know nothing way. But I in, I in no way mean to impugn – the work of Tom Cross. He'll see, I'm trying to use big words so he won't know how ignorant I am. There's room for all sorts of these kind of things, even on the Dune Steef. Whoa. Yeah, I yeah. mean, hopefully people will be like, wow, this doesn't seem like a Dune Steef story, and yet they ran it. They're trying to expand their horizons. <laughs> this is good stuff here. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'd have to agree with you. Yeah, Tom wrote himself a good story, and uh, I really enjoyed reading it. And then later performing my share of it. And uh, cyberpunk may not be my favorite genre, but like like you said a couple weeks ago when we ran our first uh, steampunk story, this author is good enough to have made me say, hey, there's a cyberpunk story that I like now. And uh, I, I think that's somewhat of an accomplishment for him to have taken someone who's not a fan of his genre and yet written a story in his genre good enough that I liked it enough to put it on the show. So good job, Tom. Wow, that's awesome. I won't say any more. I think that's a perfect way to end the show. I was going to talk about just the bleakness and the unhappiness of the story, but probably not necessary. Okay. (laughs) So now we've come to the part of the show Rish really hates. Oh, no. Not the hate letter of the week. Uh, Look, I know we're long-winded and fond of poopy jokes. Do we have to acknowledge it on the air? Uh, Rish, we actually retired the whole uh, hate letter thing. Oh, yeah. In honor of the late B. Arthur. You said it, O-8-O-T. 
No, uh, now we need to ask our gentle listeners if they would be so kind as to send us a donation. Yes, beg for donations. There's a PayPal link with a $5 a month, $5 a quarter, or a one-time donation option on it. Whatever you're able to give, it helps pay our authors, helps us cover our hosting fees. It also helps Rish feel less alone in the world. No, it doesn't. Not really. I know there's not a ton of money floating around out there, but if you're able, any size donation, great or small, is appreciated. Yeah, size doesn't matter. You just keep telling yourself that, friend. Zing! (laughs) Warning, movie spoilers. If you plan to see the movie we are speaking of in today's episode, we recommend you wait until later to listen to it. So since last we podcasted, Podcasted or podcast? What is the past tense of podcast? I mean, it's not a real word, but the word broadcast, which is a real word, is one of those words where you can go either way, I think. Okay. So So, since the last time we podcast, a movie came out. A movie I was really excited about. Really? Yes. James Cameron's new movie, Avatar. And uh, I was so excited about it that I wet my seat. I forced you to come That's see the movie. That's what that smell was? I kind of noticed that about 15 minutes in, but I don't want to say anything. Uh, so, yeah, we went and saw that show. You did force me to go see it with you. So you wouldn't have seen it otherwise? Well, you know how lame I am. I probably wouldn't have seen it till it made it to video or something like that. If, if I had no friends to force me to go see films, I, I would probably never get around to seeing anything. I, I mean... We did a whole show about The Princess and the Frog, and we begged all of our listeners to go and watch it, and I still haven't seen it. That's how lame I, think there's, I am. I think there's a word for that. Yeah? Warning, today's episode contains the F word. No, no, not that word. It was going to be hypocrite, but okay, never mind. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm just awful, and I do still plan on seeing Princess and the Frog, but, you know, if you don't see it the weekend that it comes out, then everybody will think that the movie's a failure, which I think it turned out to be anyways, but I didn't put in my two cents, or maybe I should say $25, $30 worth to support it, and that's a movie I really, really wanted to see. Now, Avatar, you know, I've heard good things about it and heard it would be interesting, but it wasn't one that I had to see. I guess I'm the problem with Hollywood these days. All they make is remakes, and we've complained about that, I think, recently. They'll only make remakes or some source material that already has existed before. It's because of crap holes like me that won't go to see a movie unless they really assume that it's going to be something that they'll like. So if they make a Batman movie, then I'll go see it. If they make an Iron Man movie, I'll go see it. If they make Star Wars prequel, I'll go see it. But if they make Avatar, then I have to have a friend like you to drag me to it who's a big Cameron fan. Okay. I'm sorry for ruining Hollywood. It's all my fault. Well, your wife got pushing (laughs) daisies canceled, so you had to do your part. (laughs) That's right. I had to ruin something. Okay, well, see, that that's interesting because I've been excited about Avatar for years. Yeah, I know. You've been telling me about it. I'd never even heard about it until you started telling me about it recently. Like in the last six months, saying Jim Cameron's Avatar is finally going to get finished. And I was like, finally? I hadn't heard anything about it. Turns out he's been making it for like seven years, right? I don't know. I think he intended to do it after Titanic, and I think it had a release date in 99. But uh... So longer than seven years then. <laughs> It's been a while, yeah. Yeah, I don't know that we want to spend a whole episode talking about it, especially since so many people will have seen Well, that's the thing with these episodes. They become obsolete, right, as soon as we record them. I mean, who's going to want to go back and listen to us talk about Wally? Right? I don't know. Wally's cool. No, no, no. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with Wally, but you've seen it on video a hundred times, or, or your grandkids know about Wally at this point. <laughs> Why would you want to know our initial impression of it 24 hours after going to see it? Or does that beg the question, why would anybody want to listen to anything we have to say? (laughs) Pretty much, I guess. You said it, Rish. Why do they care what irrational fears we have? I don't know. Uh, We don't have to talk too much about it. I thought it might be fun to uh, talk about our impression since we have done this before in the past. It was an event movie. Yeah. It was one of those that people, well, I had been talking about for months and people had been anticipating for years. 
Yeah, we, I mean, we got to the theater and there was a line around the corner and down the street. Kind of, well, it wasn't that much, but it was all wrapped around inside the theater. It was too friggin' cold outside for it to be around the corner and down the street. So it was definitely one of those kind of things. And there was all the people in line talking and there was there, nobody dressed up as a blue alien, though. No, but there were a couple of idiots that had their 3D glasses on in line. Yeah. It was all, I, I would say, 80% of the audience was college kids. Uh-huh. Right? Wouldn't you? Now, well, we yeah, saw probably. opening night, uh, the 11 o'clock show, wasn't it? Yeah. 11 p.m. show because you had to work. Uh-huh. And it was sold out. And yeah, it was full. Uh-huh. Uh, if we hadn't taken those handicapped spots, we would have had to sit up way up in the corner or down in front. And I left at 10 o'clock for the theater. So unless you camped out, you're not going to get your best seat. Although I thought our seats were really good. Yeah, they were pretty good seats. I didn't mind them at all. Good thing there was no handicapped folks around. What's the worst seats you've ever had for a uh, viewing of a film? I, I think worst seat ever was opening night that The Rock came out. Gentlemen, welcome to The Rock. My roommate and I went to it, and we didn't even get to sit together. We had to both of us sit in the second and third row, the farthest seat against the wall, Definitely not close enough to take in the whole movie, but, you know, it's one of those where you have to angle your neck to look yeah. at the screen. And, oh, and what's worst? Michael Bay directed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about you, man? The worst seat I ever had was for Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. They melvined me. Station. <laughs> Station, you have a most excellent butt. <laughs> I saw that movie twice in the theater. Did oh. you? I saw it opening day. Yeah, you know, Bill and Ted's uh, Excellent Adventure had been a pretty big success. And so this sequel was looked forward to, but it was terrible and awful. And I was front row, very corner seat. So the whole time I had my neck completely craned to the side and I had to slouch way down in my chair and turn that way so that I could see the screen. It was absolutely the worst I've ever had to deal with. And yeah, when I left that theater, my neck hurt so bad. It was like a week before I could turn my head back and forth again. It was like I had whiplash from a bad car accident after that. It was awful. Wow. Hey, announcer man, how about you? What's the worst uh, seating experience you've ever had? I don't know. He may be the reason that Hollywood sucks. Oh. Now, they, that wasn't my worst movie-going experience. I, I hate to get off on a tangent because <laughs> we said it was going to be short. Uh, we went and saw High School High, and we were like in the middle of the theater, and these drunk frat boys came in at the beginning, and they were being really loud, and you could hear clinking of bottles. So they brought in beer. I guess where they were sitting, people were shushing them. And so they got up loudly in the middle of the movie and walked out into the aisle and then went to the back row of the theater where they could talk and belch and do the things that frat boys do. But then about two thirds of the way through the movie, there started to be this this ruckus. Is that a word? It's in the back of the theater. And people were going, oh, 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 ah. And I was like, what the heck? And uh, eventually we realized one of these guys had vomited all this beer and it started to slowly (laughs) roll down the the decline theater and it would go row to row and get into, you know, continue. And people would jump up and get out of the way and go, ah, and all that stuff. And by the time it got to us, you know, the smell, I mean, how much would this guy have had to have vomited (laughs) for it to come all the way down to where we were sitting? But it did. must have just been very liquidy. Well, yeah. I mean, he he must have drank a lot of beer. There was nothing but beer in it. There was no food involved. I don't really remember High School High all that much, thank goodness. I don't remember it at all. I do remember that experience and the smell and that (laughs) the phenomenon of people going, oh, and not knowing why they were doing it. It was, you know, somebody had let a porcupine loose in the theater or something. They were jumping up and getting out of the way. Yeah, I remember that night. Yeah, I had had a lot to drink, and I did feel a little ill by the time the uh, movie got a little further on. But I, yeah, I don't remember the movie at all. I just I woke up in the back of my friend's truck and uh, no clothes on. It was strange. Okay, so Avatar. Oh yeah, Avatar. Did I did I insist that we see it in three D, or was that just a given? I think it was just a given. I mean, you told me 
over the last year about how this was made for 3D. This was like supposed to revolutionize 3D storytelling, etc. So if that's the case, then you got to see it in 3D. Right before I left for work to go to this movie, my friend was saying that his mom had gone to see the film. And she's called him up and said, oh, you're going to have to go see this film. You're going to love it. It's so great. It's going to be your favorite. He's like, really? Oh, cool. Did you see it in 3D? And his mom went, oh, it was in 3D? Now I'm going to have to see it again. So <laughs> you don't want to be that person. Well, you and I have seen movies that were made for 3D in 2D. I mean, everybody has, right? Uh-huh. I think so. And you always wonder. It's like, oh, what am I missing? Or, oh, how would that have looked? Because lots of times there are things that are just so obviously geared toward the 3D. Right. Most of the time when you see that, though, I just groan and think, oh, another one of those stupid gimmicks. Like when I got coerced into seeing Monsters vs. Aliens and in like the first scene, there's this guy with his paddle ball hitting the ball straight out into the audience. It's just like, <laughs> makes me think of that start of friday the 13th part 3d where right at somewhere off the top there's a shot of a kid and he does his yo-yo right at the camera you just go well what was weird was there wasn't any of that was there i I don't want to sound like an a-hole but i'm gonna sound like it if i am one so thank you I don't think the experience would have been any different had we seen it in 2D. Because it was the story and the music and the special effects that we focused on. There were very, very rarely anything that flashed up toward the screen or, you know what I mean? It was just some kind of extra or something like that. I don't know, like having a subwoofer, you know, in your sound system. And I'll just get this out of the way. By about like the 15 minute mark or the 20 minute mark, the only reminder that I was seeing a 3D movie was how uncomfortable those glasses were. (laughs) Where I'd have to shift them so that they were on the top of my head instead of my ears. And and when you did shift them, that would when, you know, you lift it up and rub on the bridge of your nose or whatever to make that weird numbing feeling go away. Then the screen goes crazy blurry for a second as you've got them away from your eyes. But yeah, it definitely was that way. The previews for all the films that went before the actual movie, they were all gimmicks, all craziness, all things bouncing out of the screen at you. And by the time the previews were over, I felt sick to my stomach. After about 15 minutes, luckily, you know, Avatar being not made as a gimmick, you know, it, it eventually settled down and I was able to not feel nauseous at it, which was good, I think. Yeah, I'm not saying that it didn't seem worth it, but I didn't get much more out of the movie, I don't think, than I would have just seen it in 2D. Mm -hmm. Okay, there were a couple parts with like the little dandelion things or whatever floating around that are like, oh, neat. But I forgot about that unless something specific happened to jump out. And it almost never did. Yeah. It just it was in the back of my mind. And I think that was Cameron's intention. He had always said that he didn't want there to be gimmicks and he wanted it to be an immersive experience. And the more you are grabbing at things in front of you, the less you're concentrating on the story. Right. I don't know. I guess I like the gimmicks. I really enjoyed Friday the 13th Part 3 when I saw it in 3D. And when I saw it in 2D, I thought that it was the stupidest one of the first nine, you know? Just because the things jumping out made it fun. And I was like, ooh, yeah, kind of thing. All right. So 3D, not necessary, but worked just fine. It's fair to say that. You and I saw Up together. We podcasted about it. I never went back and saw it in 3D. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I'll never know what I was missing. But I loved Up in 2D. And I feel like Avatar would have been enough. Yeah, I think so. Protecting your movie for the future or something like that. Because, you know, you're going to see it in 3D in the theater once or twice. But it's going to be on your DVD shelf for the rest of your life. Or your video chip shelf or whatever it is turns out to be the next format. And you're going to see it in 2D a hundred times or many more times anyways. If you're going to have to groan at those cheesy gimmicks every time they come up, it's going to be like when you saw it in 2D and you thought it's the stupidest one of them all. So probably a good idea to hold off on those gimmicks. So what did you think of the movie itself? I mean, you called it before we ever went to see it that it was going to be Dances with Aliens. Or Dances with Wolves with Aliens. I don't remember exactly how you uh, phrased it. I have heard some people call it Dances with Smurfs because they're blue people, although they're not very small. 
It dances with giant Smurfs. But yeah, what did you think of the overall story? It was a big epic movie, an experience, in the same way that Titanic was an experience. And I think I liked it more than Titanic. Well, um, it's more along the lines of the kind of stuff than you and I like, rather than, you know, historical drama or whatever. Okay. Is it safe to say that it was a more male-targeted film than Titanic was? I think so. Because I think the character you relate to in Titanic is Rose. Mm -hmm. Maybe Jack is somebody that you're like, oh, I'm just like Jack and I could be that guy. But I never felt like that. <laughs> I've never been like Jack in any way. Um, it's not like I'm Kate Winslet or anything like that, but she was just along for the ride and looking around and everybody was interacting with her. Right. She didn't know her way around the ship and all that stuff the way that these other characters did. So I think she was your entry point in Titanic. Yeah. And for Avatar, Jake Sully was definitely the entry point. The guy who didn't know about the planet, didn't know about the culture, didn't know about the aliens, didn't know about their animals, just like us. So when people explain that stuff to him, you know, thank goodness, there is that protagonist. That there, There's there's a word, that entry character. I, I, I can't remember what it is. I think it might even be one of those Campbellian words. <laughs> Maybe not. Campbellian a word? Ah, you got me. I don't know. It did, maybe I should just kick it back to you. What did you think of the story? Because Same. because for me, the story and the visuals, the experience, were practically one and the same. What I came out of the movie with was the wonder of that movie, more so than thinking that it had a really solid script or great dialogue. Or... Right. I would have to agree with you. I think while it was a serviceable story or whatever you want to say about it, it was not really the focus of it. It was more the visual experience that you got out of this film than it was that backstory. And the story was good. It was interesting. It kept me interested the whole way through. I don't know. Some of the stuff, it seemed like it could have been, you know, it's supposed to be a sci-fi film. There's all these people f walking around in robot outfits and there's giant helicopter carrier ships that uh, shoot rockets and stuff like that. And then you have your noble savages out there. The, the thing that I thought was kind of a bummer about it was it seemed like a little less imaginative than it could have been as far as the alien world was. You had these people who were supposed to be a parallel of your Native Americans or your Africans or your Aborigines or whatever, and they shoot bows and arrows. I don't know what else you could come up with, but uh, it seems like putting a little more imagination into it might be cool. They ride horses. They may have six legs and their heads glow or something, but they're basically horses. They even make the exact same sound as horses when they run. I guess they flew pterodactyls. That's a little different. I don't know of any. No, no, Australian Aborigines. Oh, they flew pterodactyls? I didn't know. They could have gone a little further into trying to come up with something that's a little more alien. They had giant mushrooms instead of regular sized mushrooms or gigantic trees that they lived in instead of normal sized trees. There's one really big tree, but instead of being a tree, it could have been, uh, I don't know, something else, you know. But it didn't take away from the enjoyment. It just seemed more like instead of being a sci-fi story, it seemed like a fantasy story, if you know what I'm saying. You have, like, the woods with the elves in it. The people, even the aliens, basically looked almost exactly like people, but they were bigger and they were blue and their, the bridge of their nose was larger or something like that. And they had ponytails that had things that came out the end of them. And that was an interesting idea, but how the heck does the ponytail thing exactly work out the braid? It seemed like they should have had a tentacle coming out of their head or something instead. I suppose the point of doing all that is to keep it still relatable to those of us that uh, are mainstream viewers instead of making it you know really fantastic to where you know you have to figure out what the heck the deal is and, and then you can't relate to the character because they're like some kind of strange cockroach creature that's hard to think oh no the earthlings are going to blow up the cockroach creatures everybody hates cockroaches so you don't worry if they're going to blow them up that kind of reminded me of that as we were watching the film. I remember six months ago or something like that on the show, we talked about Battle for Terra. 
which was the story about the evil humans who were coming to destroy the poor defenseless aliens world and that's basically the same plot as this and we talked about how a bad idea that was and you know we're, we're making the people the ones that we're supposed to relate with into the evil ones and yet we've done the same thing with this story i don't know to be fair it was all me that said that you yeah, have no idea true. about battle for terra and of course i thought about that when the movie was over because i really liked avatar mm -hmm. and i thought how am i going to defend myself when we do this episode <laughs> Because, yeah, you could play that back, me <laughs> saying the things that you just said and how stupid that was and how could anybody think that that would work for a story for a movie. Now, my first impression is to wonder if these Battle for Terra a-holes didn't steal the idea from Avatar, which has been in production for all these years. But maybe not. I mean, maybe that's a uh, timely idea that's in everyone's heads that human nature is pretty shitty. But uh, it's a timeless idea, actually. Part of it was that uh, that was a children's movie, Battle for Terra, and that that was in the uh, trailer in the ad campaign was the snarling piece of crap humans coming to destroy these aliens. Whereas in Avatar, I mean, I, I don't think it's a kid's movie. No, I don't know. My niece was jealous that she, that we were going to see it, and so I tried to think about that while we were watching it if, well would she enjoy this would is there stuff for a, a nine-year-old girl in this movie is there stuff for a girl at all warning comments from rich outfield we just wiped out a, a large swath of politically incorrect things i just said but yeah i did wonder because with the stuff with the marines and the big power lifters because that's what they were and the big helicarrier and those helicopters and the fighting and the, all that stuff. I, it was just boy-centric. I was <laughs> digging it. And uh, I did wonder. I mean, they gave Natiri a lot to do. Right. She was not just a damsel in distress. She was right. not worthless. She was and, but I did a strong keep, female character, which you don't get that often in the well, if action it's a, movie. Well, if like it's a this. James Cameron movie, you do. True. No matter what. Which I think is great with him. I mean, he's inspired a lot of filmmakers, I think. To show that a woman can be an action hero, but she doesn't have to be a stupid, cold, heartless bitch or a man with breasts. And lots Keep of those and cards I'm, and letters coming, folks. And I, and I know that maybe I'm saying things that sound offensive, but how many times have you seen a movie where to make the female action character formidable, she's just a heartless ball breaker? <laughs> wow, she's not likable at all. Um, but, you know, that's something that Cameron did in his movies over and over again is to say, OK, she still has a heart and she still cares and she still fears and she's still a woman. But we can also look up to her and root for her and find her to be powerful. And uh, I, I felt like the, that with the female character in this, she was definitely a nurturer. She was definitely a feminine character from the very beginning, even though I bought that she was able to take these dudes down and. Sometimes I, I want to know a female perspective, uh, uh, what somebody sees from the other side, because lots of times these movies are real lopsided or they're baffling to me. Like the way that Mary Jane behaved in Spider-Man 3, I just didn't get it. She was villainous in Spider-Man 3. And uh, I've sat down with women before and asked them what's going on and... Apparently, that's one of those things you're not supposed to ask in polite conversation. Are you going somewhere with this, Grish? As far as this movie goes, I, I, I get the impression just from the 30 minutes we've been talking that I liked it a lot more than you did. And that's fine. I liked it an awful lot. I'm just, you know, like I said, you know, I thought it would have been cooler if they made it more of an alien world than it was. Basically, they went all the way across space to Pandora and found 17th century America there instead. With okay. blue Indians instead of uh, red Indians. Okay, but. well, I'm I'm going to disagree with you. I, I've never seen anything like Avatar. That was just, I, the whole time my jaw was dropped with just the imagination of this world and the fauna and the things that went bloop, 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 bloop. when you touched them <laughs> and the way that the horse creatures had eyes down below their mouth and these gill type things that they breathed through. It was totally immersive and unlike anything I had ever seen. And that was part of the joy of seeing the movie was just like, holy cow, this is magical to me. Seeing Helena Bonham Carter with an eight foot head 
is just disturbing. <laughs> but seeing these creatures, these dragons or whatever, and the 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 tentacle, the that feelers, was a very interesting idea. The, the connecting so that they could yeah. mentally control these animals. Um, now maybe that is in a lot of fantasy books. And as you often point out, I've, I've never read a book to save my life. <laughs> but I'd never seen that in a movie. Even cartoons where anything is possible, I hadn't seen that wide a variety of creatures or things that had, in, in my mind, no parallel. And maybe the previous benchmark was Lord of the Rings, except for the fact that that's been around for 70 years. So we know of elves and dragons and you know, all that stuff. It may be when Lord of the Rings came out. If if it had been a movie first, that's how I would have felt uh, the way I, I felt about Avatar. All right. Now, do you think that this is going to sweep the Oscars the, the way that Titanic did? How would you compare this movie to Titanic? I, or is it In, even comparable? They're not very similar, really, as far as how much people are going to love it or... Right. Are people going to rally behind this and proclaim it, you know, the movie of the year? Are are people going to go see it again and again and again and again when Oscar nominations come out in February? Is it going to be nominated for Best Picture and Best Actor and Best Screenplay and Best Director and Best Score and Best Special Effects and as Best Editing and Best Supporting Actor? And, you know, a, a Titanic had more nominations than anything had ever had. I mean, I think it tied Ben Hur or something like that. So in fifty years, you know, this is what we had gotten. Uh -huh. I don't see that being the case with Avatar. Like you said before, it's a very boy centric film. So boys are going to go and see it, but I don't think girls will go and see it as much. But one of the things that made Titanic such a big deal was that love story in it that really seemed to resonate with girls, with teenage girls, the kind of people that are going to go back and see a film a second time and a third time and a fourth time and et cetera and so on until the nth time, which is what people did with Titanic. And, of course, it raked in all sorts of money because of it. I don't see it doing as well in Oscars, maybe because where Titanic was a historical drama slash action adventure type movie, this is a sci-fi film or a sci-fi slash fantasy, whatever you want to call it, but those genres don't get respect. And uh, sometimes you get some kind of a upstart. Sometimes you get that movie that uh, is in that genre that Nobody respects, like you get a Silence of the Lambs, which is nominated for an Oscar, or you get a Babe that is nominated for an Oscar, or you get a Beauty and the Beast, and, uh, you know, those break through the barriers. I guess it's possible that it could happen with Avatar, but I don't see it being that likely. You're definitely going to get nominations for the things that sci-fi movies always get nominations for, like visual effects and maybe score. I don't know. I don't remember the score being especially distinctive. It wasn't like uh, the Titanic score. I don't remember. It wasn't bad or anything, but it wasn't one that you walked away whistling. Uh, I, yeah, but I don't know what else it might get nominated for. Effects, editing. Well, what what about Best Director, James Cameron? I don't know. Again, it doesn't. it's not the kind of film that fits into those Academy. Oh, but then again, they're doing 10 nominations for Best uh, Movie of the Year. So I guess it's really possible if they're I, doing 10. I'd forgotten that. I think the uh, whole idea behind doing 10 is so that they can get a few movies that people have actually heard of in the uh, nominations for Best Picture. So it could happen. Um, you might get Up nominated for Best Picture, or you might get Avatar or something like that thrown in there just to appease the masses and get somebody to actually watch the Oscars again. That is true. The more high-profile the movies that have been nominated, the higher the ratings end up being. A lot of people just assume that they'll just nominate five more Best obscure films. Yeah, art house films. Well, we'll see. I, it's the end of the year. The best movie I saw in 2009 was Up. I loved that movie. Because it's animated, I highly doubt they'll nominate it for Best Picture. But it certainly should be nominated, I thought. I'll bet it's on a lot of critics' top ten lists next to, you know, Precious, based on the book by The Hurt Locker and these art films. Uh -huh. I'll be impressed if they do nominate up. A lot of people complained last year that Dark Knight wasn't nominated, but I was more upset that Wally yeah, wasn't. Yeah, me too. That's... Uh... 
what I've heard is the part of the point of why they went to 10 is to give those kind of movies a chance. So maybe we'll see Avatar nominated. I think it would be a huge upset and it'd be a really long shot for it to actually win. And it might be because of that fact that it's similar to Dances with Wolves or, or, or something Dances like that. Dances with Wolves won Best Picture in 90. True. Did you notice the parallels? There were actually a couple of moments that felt completely lifted. <laughs> yeah, you. Uh, there was the one part where uh, while we were watching the movie, you know, the, the two characters turned and they looked at each other. And, and I turned and, and said to you, can you see that I am not afraid of you? The line from... Uh, wind in his hair. Wind in his hair. Stands with a fist. Throws like a girl. But, uh, yeah, you know, there were times when it seemed like that. I was wondering about that. I, I saw somebody had done a blog or something about how they thought this movie was a racist movie. Because it's like the white man's fantasy of the uh, native experience where, uh, you know, this white man, like John Dunbar from uh, Dances with Wolves, who goes... And becomes one with the tribe and becomes, you know, a respected member and a, sort of a leader among them. And uh, the same way this guy goes and he becomes one with them and then he becomes a leader for them. And they question why is it that this white man has to come in and show them the way instead of perhaps wind in his hair, which I don't know what the character's name was in Avatar. But uh, why couldn't this guy be the guy who, you know... Why do we have to have the Avatar? Why can't the poor benighted savage be uh, able to lead his own tribe towards victory? I don't know. It's a it's an interesting thing to consider. Well, why did why didn't Red Leader blow up the Death Star? Why did it have to be this farm boy? Because that was our character. That right. was us. Right. That was and and I I I'm not saying that your idea or this person's yeah, yeah, idea was mine, but... is is stupid. I just hate that shit. I hate the <laughs> everything is racist. Every, the princess and the frog is racist because fill in the blank. Whatever is racist because can can we just put away racism and just not use that card anymore and just say, hey, 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 we'll put it in a, a glass case and it'll be there if you ever really, really need it. But please, please don't cry wolf. Don't don't grab that card and flash it around because you will get a paper cut. Or give it to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I know that that's not something nice that I'm supposed to say. But it was a movie. And, and Jake Sully was us. And he was a Marine. So he knew the Marine way of thinking and how to defeat them and their weaknesses and all that stuff. I don't know. I, I was too young when Dances with Wolves came out to hear if there were people that complained right. about the gentrification of the Indians in that movie or the romanticification non Uncle Tomification of the characters. In fact, I think it was quite the opposite in 90 that many Indian groups held up this film as an example of that, hey, we are noble and proud and good people, and it's something to aspire to be. And that's why John Dunbar casts off his name and becomes Dances with Wolves and stays with them till the end of the movie, which is exactly what happens with Jake Sully, although I think he's still called Jake Sully in the movie. Or Jake this, Sully. Uh, is that what it was? I think that's how they came out with it, which I thought was funny because they had a really hard time pronouncing his name, but they pronounced everything else really well. I guess that made it cute. I don't know. I, I, it's it's too early to know if it's a giant hit or just a medium-sized hit. Yeah, they I were think saying it's... that the opening weekend may be a record for December, but uh, not a record for all time kind of a thing. Well, and that's something I think we've talked about in the past, but if not, we'll talk about it again. There's going to be a record every couple of years yep, broken every week because everything costs more. You and I paid twelve dollars a ticket, twelve fifty a ticket to see this movie Ridiculous. or whatever, which I've never paid since L.A. And even in L.A., it was like one movie a year I was willing to pay that much money for. And so, of course, everything makes more money than two years before. But anyhow, it's definitely going to break even. And by the time it hits DVD, it'll be in the black. Unless teenage boys go and see it again and again, like you said about the teenage girl right. with Titanic. Cameron has said that he'd like to make two more, that this is the first of a trilogy. Oh, really? But I can't see it. Me I don't know what's left there. I, I was a little bit curious about what we had done to Earth. 
Mm-hmm. But that has nothing to do with Jake right. and, anymore. Or this world that we're on. Yeah, I never felt that they needed a Matrix Part 2 and 3 either. That's so. awesome. I was totally going to say that. That was the movie I was going to make a parallel to because he becomes Superman at the end. And the bad guys are vanquished. Or yeah. the, the main bad guy is vanquished. Now, granted, in Avatar, we lose Quaritch? Quidditch? What's his name? The bad General, guy. Right. But there's still military out there. There's still human beings out I there and all there that. I can see there being some kind of a war in the future or something like that between the worlds. But I don't know. I guess there could be a story in that. But uh, it doesn't seem like there needs to be. And I agree. But uh, Cameron used to always talk about making a, another True Lies. And he made Terminator 2, which was an excellent sequel. Yeah. Aliens was an excellent sequel. They should that. make a Titanic 2. That would be awesome. Gloria Stewart's still alive. Let's do it. Overall, I think both of us really enjoyed the film. It is really a fantastic visual experience. There's just something really to be said to it. Usually we complain about films that sell themselves entirely as a visual experience. But just it's something to behold. It's really worth it just for that fact. There are some amazing things to look at that are just worth seeing just because they're neat to see. And uh, there's some good story and, and acting and et cetera to go along with it. So it's got it all. It's got, well, it doesn't have it all, but it has, it has a lot. I think it's got pretty close to it all. Now, Cameron hadn't made a movie in a dozen years, and I've really missed him. He's different than anybody else. Now, granted, he seems to have much more of the militarization in all of his movies, but I don't mind that. And, and Some of he... my favorite uh, sci-fi books or military sci-fi, like Ender's Game and Starship Troopers. And... and another thing that I think he does really, really well is he makes just despicable bad guys. Yeah. Uh, I, I totally wanted to just blow that guy's head off. And that, I thought that was really fun. <laughs> he was a much better bad guy, I think, than Billy Zane was in Titanic by far. He was ten times more detestable. Well, I'm glad that Cameron is making movies again. I hope it makes a lot of money. I think it would be neat if he did a movie with like a $40 million budget. Just go back to his roots and write something and say, okay, this is going to be set in the real world with a low budget and uh, just let the story run everything. Because this is one where the effects ran everything, but not in the way that so many of these awful summer blockbusters that are just empty experiences. Right. And there's hundreds of millions of dollars on the screen, but nothing in the heart. The special effects help to tell the story and help to put you in the world. And cool thing about it too was that the world wasn't some sterile picture world. It was, it looked, it seemed like a real place. It's pretty cool. I don't know if we covered the movie well enough. I really honestly only wanted to talk for 10 minutes, 5 minutes. Cut this but, way down then. The whole part about the racism, edit that part out. No. It, uh, the that, part about the handicap seat, edit that out. Those may be the only two interesting things that we've said in this whole podcast. The but, part about the story, edit that part out. Oh, and the part about the visual experience, you can edit that out. The only thing that really needs to stay in is how uncomfortable 3D glasses are. All right. <laughs> Okay, we'll end with that. Hope there are more movies in the new year that are worth talking about. There'll be something, even if we have to talk angrily and poorly about uh, them. Hoodwinked too. Hey, look forward to that. All right, that's been our show. I'm Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. I may as well go home, as I did on my own. Alone again. Naturally. Bye-bye. See you guys later. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. And now I'm going for a smoke break. Take two. Hey, Paul. You done for the day? I think I'll see if I can get... Uh... Josh to do that voice. Anybody but you. <gasps> wow, you really are so good. Hey, everybody, this is it. Mouthball's ball. dropping. Three, two, two one. one. <laughs>
Okay, we don't need that sound effect right now. Roosevelt Island, he told the driver, because that was where he had conjoined the girl. If you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I dreamt about conjoining one time. <laughs> Don't come back. I won't. Paul assured him as he turned to go. Douche. For a moment, he debated going... Yeah. <laughs> I've been debating that myself. <laughs> <laughs> ah, la 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 la. I'm a dumb child. He checked the street for observers, then stepped closer to Natalie and put the porticon to her skin. Porticon. Autobots, the porticons are attacking. Laquona's la comparsa. <laughs> ¿Quién es más macho? It only works if you do the Spanish. <laughs> now that he knew what to look for, he recognized the signature of her implants. Oh, implants from his conjunction. <laughs> They're just talking about something else. Deep down, I thought you loved him too much. I thought you felt for him what he felt for you. But you murdered him. You cut into him with gusto, and all I could do was watch. Wow. Sorry. Telenovela. Come yes. on. When did that happen? We switched channels here. <laughs> They need never be alone again. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Crosshill. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>